Hi everybody, my name is Sandy Mill. I am the Admissions Director at Sydney Sussex College, part of the University of Cambridge. And in this video, we're going to be focusing on what you can be doing right now in order to strengthen your applications to competitive universities across the country, not just Oxford and Cambridge, but in fact, a whole host of universities that are really looking for you to show your skills have got some of the most competitive courses in the country. And while it may feel like everything is kind of shut down right now, because it actually has, even though resources are somewhat limited, a lot of places are closed, you may not have access to the same amount of schoolwork that you're currently doing, and exams may well be out of the question right now if you are planning to do those this year. In fact, there are still a whole host of things that you can do to help strengthen your application and make sure you give yourself the best chance of getting those university places that you want. And if you're feeling bored at home right now, you've run out of things to do, this is going to really help you fill that time and make the most of it. So let's crack on into it. So there is a bit of a myth that still goes around about what we as universities are really looking for from a prospective student. And it's one of those ones that basically a lot of teachers, parents, adults kind of still have in their head from back in their day that has now actually kind of become a little bit out of date, but still gets passed around quite a bit. And you may have heard this being said before, people often think that what we're really looking for at top universities is what they call the well-rounded person. And to that mind, people should be doing a whole lot of extracurricular activities to show that they've got a lot going on, a lot in their head, they can you know, manage a lot of things, they're an interesting person. And that really isn't true in terms of the top universities and what we're looking for nowadays. Now, your extracurricular activities are really important but we're not judging you by how many of them you do and a whole varied load. You should do what you enjoy. You know, our extracurricular activities keep us sane. They keep us happy. If I go a couple of weeks without playing my guitar, I start to get a little bit antsy and a little bit, you know, anxious. We do the things in our spare time that we do because we love them and we get joy from them. So if you get joy from it, keep on doing it. If you don't, feel free to ditch it. Your extracurricular activities are not what we are looking for. Instead, what we really want to see, rather than the well-rounded person, as it were, what we're really looking for at the top universities is what we call the university-ready student. And this is a fairly basic idea. We're looking for people who are going to be able to step into university and adapt to university life really quickly. You're going to be able to pick up the new styles of teaching, that independence, that self-motivation that is very different from school, and you're going to get going and do well straight from the start and get good grades at the end of it and hopefully not be a big pain in the backside. You're going to adapt well to the modes of university teaching and life as an adult that is at university and learning. So to that mind, the question becomes, well, how can we prove that we are university ready students? There is a simple method for doing this. And basically it involves rather than doing extracurricular activity, doing a little bit of what we call supercurricular activity instead. Now, the difference between supercurricular activity and extracurricular activity is fairly simple. Both are things that you do in your spare time, but supercurricular activity has some academic relevance to it. Something which has got some content that is related to the course or courses that you want to do, and that is showing that you are really interested in it and is gonna prove those skills that we are really looking for. And we do need to prove them because, you know, as people, we can say anything we like about ourselves. It doesn't make it true. You know, you look at nearly everyone's social media accounts and, you know, you can see a little bit of people talking themselves up or maybe saying things that aren't necessarily the case. Prove it. We need to see the proof that you are exactly the type of person that is going to thrive at our universities. So, how does this do that? Let's, let's prove that for you right now. Doing supercurricular study, some extra study in your spare time, it demonstrates a lot of what we're looking for. It shows passion for the subject or subjects you want to study because you're spending that valuable free time that you've got and you could be doing anything else, learning more about it. It shows self-motivation because you've actually bothered to go out and do it rather than you know just sitting at home, you know, playing games or doing something else that you really enjoy, just a hobby. You've actually you know, committed yourself to it in that way. It shows some independent study skills because you've gone out and found material to study and you've used it really, really well. Doesn't mean that everything has to be fully relevant, but 
but you've actually found some relevant material and you've gone exploring because that's what we do at university. You're not on the rails all the time. You're an educational explorer, finding out brand new things, reading things, deciding for yourself what you want to look at. It shows resilience because, you know, you've managed to fit this in around the schoolwork that you've got going on, around the other things that, you know, are life, basically. You've managed to still do that and organise your time in a way that made it possible. Supercurricular study proves that you are the type of student that is going to thrive at university. And it should be the focus, actually, of a lot of your application. Your personal statement will probably be around 80% supercurricular activity based if you're talking about Oxford and Cambridge and we'll come be back with a couple more videos to talk about personal statements as we get close to the time I'll come back with one on how to do your first drafts of them and also how to do the redrafting process as well to kind of guide you through that process but most of it is going to be based around this supercurricular study that you do so before you even tackle that personal statement you need to start getting a whole bank of it together doing some exploring of your subject as well as that, it might also come up in your interviews. It's a very common thing that um, interviewers at university will use the personal statement as the basis for some or maybe even all of the questions. And this isn't to try and catch you out to see whether you've actually read it or not. But what they're doing is trying to get you relaxed, talking about something that you're really interested in, that you geek out a bit, a little bit to kind of get the conversation going and flowing, start you off in a place where you're familiar rather than something completely unfamiliar that you may not know anything about. So the idea is really to kind of help people get into the interview in that way. Your supercurricular study is also vital for making sure you're studying the right subject. If this is boring, if this is a pain in the backside, if it is a chore, are you studying the right subject? Is this really what you want to be doing? Because the whole idea of supercurricular activity is to try before you buy, to get an idea of what it's like studying this subject at university. You're going to be doing that for three plus years of your life, depending on the course. So if you really don't enjoy it, do you really want to be doing this for the next three plus years? If you're unsure what subject you want to take, do some supercurricular study for both or all of the subjects you're considering. And that will help tell you, which one am I really interested in? Which one do I want to study in the university style? You know, which stack of activity goes down faster? Which ones do I find most interesting? That's probably going to give you an indication of which subjects you should be going for and you can trust your gut when you've got that evidence to make that decision. Now rather than giving you a list of supercurricular activity things to start off with, what I want to do is actually give you three criteria for what counts as supercurricular. The idea of this is there is no real set list of what counts here. Anything that meets these three criteria will count as supercurricular study and be great stuff to include in your applications. It's going to help you demonstrate those skills of the university ready student. So if you're wondering whether something counts, just run it through these three criteria. If it meets all of them, then it counts. Great stuff. We can use that as part of our application. If it doesn't, then it probably doesn't count. Might still be useful, but it's not going to be part of that core content we're going to put into the personal statement. And the three criteria are fairly simple. First up, relevance. Is it relevant to the subject or subjects that you want to study? If not, that's pretty much the definition of extracurricular. It's got to be relevant to that subject you want to study. And as a side note, it should be about the things that you enjoy in that subject. This is license to geek out that I'm giving you right now. You know, follow your interests when it comes down to it. Whatever your particular thing within the subject you're interested in is, you should be doing that. So, for example, I studied philosophy, and for me, it was ethics and political philosophy that I was really interested in. So I focused my extra reading on those topics. I didn't do some metaphysics or some logic because that wasn't as fun to me. And it's okay to follow what's fun here. It'll give us an idea of your personal priorities, the topics that you're interested in, what type of a student or future academic you might be. So follow your interest with that. Second criterion not part of your compulsory A-level content, by which I mean, if it's going to be on the exam, it doesn't count because you're being made to do it. It's got to be something that you're doing independently, you're doing yourself. Now, you could go deeper than what's on the syllabus, take the same topic and read further into it, some more advanced material. You could do a completely different topic in the same subject, even if you do it at school. 
So if you're at school doing history, and a lot of it's been 20th century based, do something different, or a different geographical area that's not on the course. Great, that counts. Or if you do do a topic that you're particularly interested in from your studies, go way past that. Push further into stuff that you're not expected to learn on the syllabus. If you're doing a project as part of your qualifications, so for example, the EPQ, Extended Project Qualification, or the Welsh Baccalaureate Project, these things actually do count as supercurricular do count. And the reason for this is because there isn't a syllabus for them, there isn't specific content that you're expected to cover. You've got free choice, you've got that independence there as part of it. So it absolutely counts as supercurricular activity. And I hear a lot of people say, oh these kind of projects, they're not really useful to me. Make them useful. What they can do is ring fence that time to do more supercurricular study. So actually, if you make sure that the topic question that you're researching is relevant to the subject or subjects you want to study at uni, then actually it's incredibly useful and can really help strengthen your applications and you get a little bonus qualification at the same time. And that is brilliant. The third criterion is does it have good quality academic content? It's got to mean it's coming from a good source, someone who actually knows what they're talking about, someone who is an academic in that field or has got really strong links within it. But also it's got to have enough depth to count. It can't just be superficial. A short YouTube video or a TED talk or um, an introductory guidebook is not going to cut it here. These things are really useful and I'll explain how we can use those a little bit later. But actually what we're really looking for is some proper academic content that goes in depth that you're really going to be learning in detail from. And that is what is going to really count as supercurricular in this instance. So. To give you some ideas of what might count, I'll give you a few, but anything you can go through these criteria, just check it through them, there we go, and you can work out whether it counts or not individually. But some things that might count, depending on the subject, depending if it's got that subject relevance for you. Um, academic books and journals are vital, and I'll talk about using those in a couple of minutes' time, but you will need to do some academic reading as part of your supercurricular study. You could also use magazines, you know, for example, medical journals and the like can be great for studying medicine. You know, get up to date on the latest developments and start reading into them through that. That can be really useful. Current affairs as well for some subjects like politics can be really, really useful. One of the biggest ones that I think people don't know about, this is kind of my secret tech here, lectures and talks which are available online. So universities have their own YouTube channels and on them you'll often find lectures up on there in full that have just been filmed. Some departments have their own ones as well. So for example, the law faculty here at Cambridge has their own one, which is absolutely fantastic. And I know that they've got lectures up on there for people to watch on demand whenever they want. And the best thing is, if you're using the university YouTube channels, you know the content is good because that is gonna be an actual recorded lecture from that university delivered by a professor or a high level academic in that subject, in that field. So you know it's going to meet the good quality academic content criteria. YouTube can help you actually strengthen your university applications. They're long enough, they've got that academic depth, they're absolutely brilliant. So go onto YouTube, find some of these lectures and sessions and there'll be more and more which are getting added over this summer. And watch a few of them. Take some notes while you do it. Treat it like you're in an actual university lecture. And what you can do is improve your skills to learn as a university student while also strengthening your application to whatever universities you're applying to at the same time. That's a win-win. So, you know, grab a notepad and some paper, sit yourself down with your headphones on, and try learning like a university student. There's plenty of great content out there. This doesn't have to be a big public thing. You don't have to like, share, and subscribe. That's absolutely fine. But what you do need to do is use those lectures to help inspire you, to help you develop your skills and your subject knowledge. And those can be absolutely brilliant content. It doesn't have to be the ones that are at the universities you're considering either. So, you know, look across the universities to find all sorts of different ones. Even if you're applying to Cambridge, we don't care if you've watched a lecture by someone at Oxford. That's cool. Yeah, they're, they're a great academic. Their content's going to be brilliant. That's what counts. So it doesn't matter if it's, you know, linked to a university you want to study or not. Um, films for some subjects can be great, for example, for media studies, for foreign languages as well, because you can learn more about a language and a culture at the same time. 
I even used one when I was talking about my personal statement for philosophy, as it particularly inspired me with some of the themes that were in it. And then I went and read certain thinkers that were mentioned in this film. So, you know, you can draw your inspiration from a whole lot of places. Theatre, you know, if you're doing drama or English, go watch a play, go read the play. You could even see the film version at the same time. Well, not at the same time, you know, do it afterwards. But the point is you can analyse, you know, how the different productions have been done, literary analysis, absolutely fantastic skills for those subjects. TV programmes, good quality documentaries can be great. Use media on demand to make sure you're getting them when you want them. You don't have to channel hop through BBC4 to find something good. Use the iPlayer. You know, that's what it's there for. Netflix, Amazon, ITV. There's even a few things on YouTube there as well. Good quality documentaries are great and can be really inspiring. You know, maybe it was, you know, watching documentaries of Mary Beard that inspired you to get into archaeology or classics. Fantastic. Enjoy them. Watch them. Take some notes as you do it. Practice those note-taking skills and you're going to be strengthening your application at the same time. Do be careful, though, on the content purposes. You've got to make sure it's got that good quality academic content. So I remember um, last year watching a documentary called Eaten by an Escalator. And in there was a fantastic documentary about safety and engineering, which was trying to get out. And it absolutely didn't. It didn't have that academic depth. It was more almost like a you've been framed clip show of what happens when escalators kind of break. That wouldn't have cut it. But if it was a good quality documentary on engineering safety there, it could have been great for a study of engineering and someone who was looking at that really interestingly. Other things, um, radio shows and podcasts can be brilliant. Um, there are some excellent examples out there by academics designed to you know, get people clued up on some of the big topics, the big thinkers in there. There's some brilliant science and tech ones out there. Talking politics is great if you're um, into your politics of any variety. That comes from some Cambridge academics. So have a look around and where you normally get your podcasts, iTunes, Amazon, etc. And you can find some really great content. And that can be, you know, go for a car journey. It can normally be kind of dead time. Stick your earphones in with a podcast on and you're turning that time into something which is super curricular relevant. And that can be really brilliant. Um, museums, if they're open for history, can be excellent. And you'll find a lot of academic sessions and workshops going up online in lieu of summer schools this year. So if you can get access to any of those, those can be really useful as well, similar to the lectures that we mentioned earlier. One last thing that's on that list is work experience. Now, this isn't necessary or possible for all subjects. I studied philosophy. There isn't any such thing as philosopher as kind of a job other than being an academic. It's really hard to be able to shadow someone or do that job and get experience of it. So that's fine. Do more of the other stuff. But for subjects where there is a big professional commitment, like medicine or veterinary medicine, it is really vital. And you should, in these cases, get patient care experience, whether it is in a hospice or a hospital. You need to make sure that you're getting that where possible. Now, we are aware that because of the whole current global pandemic, this is going to hinder the possibility of work experience for many students currently. Try your best, see what you can get, but we will be looking at every application in light of this. So see what you can get. If you can't get any, do some more of the other stuff to kind of fill that gap as best you can. But we are aware of the situation as it's developing. We are taking that into account when it comes into future applications. So please don't be too stressed if it is just an absolute impossibility where you are because of COVID-19, because of how that situation is going to develop. So the big question then is, well, how can I find some of this material? You know, for a lot of people, this sounds great, but getting started is, is kind of the intimidating thing to get going. So let's give you a few places to start looking for resources and especially talk about academic reading and how to go about that. For a lot of these multimedia resources, including some books and journals, um, we've got a section on the Sydney Sussex website. Well, our college has got a section called Beyond the Syllabus on our applying pages. And that's got a whole wealth of activities that we're uploading to help people with their supercurricular study. Another great website, Oxford and Cambridge Outreach.co.uk. Now that is a joint website run by the Universities of Oxford and the University of Cambridge, basically to draw in a lot of academic sessions and content for students. So you'll find some of those academic sessions we've noted up there and a whole resource list for supercurricular activities sorted by subject as well. So that's a great place to get some starting points and ideas. 
And myheplus.com is another one that's based on a Cambridge program that has got a wealth of subject specific resources, again, organized by subjects that can be a really great starting point. These aren't the only ones out there, but they're some really good places to start having a little bit of a dig and explore into your subject. Now, I mentioned earlier that academic reading absolutely needs to be a part of what you're doing. And the reasoning for that is, is just very simple. For most subjects, and especially in the arts and humanities, that is going to be one of the primary ways that you're going to do your learning at university. It's going to be able to prove that you can you know, deal with our teaching methods, thrive in our systems, so you need to be able to show that you can do it, that you can deal with libraries, that you can find books and articles, read them and get relevant ideas from them. It's worth noting that we don't expect you to read the entirety of every book that you've mentioned. You might be picking out some excerpts, chapters, which are especially relevant, but we do need to see some evidence of that reading in your personal statement and in your supercurricular study. It's going to be really, really useful in proving that you are a university ready student. Now, the problem is, I think it can be quite intimidating for a lot of people doing this for the first time if it's not something that you're used to. And actually working out how to find books and how to actually get them as well can be something that is a hurdle to overcome. So let's give you some ideas on how to engage in academic reading and some ideas about how to find the books themselves once you've worked out what it is that you want to read. So in terms of finding the books, the first place that I would look are university reading lists. You'll find them up on our websites for the departments. Basically, these are great because these are a list of university books sorted by subject and topic, so you can find something that you're interested in really easy and you know it's going to be relevant to university life and university study. It's totally not cheating to use them. If a book has got a big dot or a star next to it, it probably means that it's a really good introductory thing or it's a really important one to read first, so make that a priority. So whatever it is your interest is, let's say you're, you're into um, physics and specifically astrophysics. Go on the physics department website for some of the universities you're considering. Download the reading list, go straight to the astrophysics sections, start reading some of the things in there. Perfect. There's your starting point. Another great place to find things to read. Talk with your teachers, email them or if you can get them on a Zoom conversation, whatever, right now. That can be really great because your teachers have degrees. They would have been to university almost certainly. And that means that they've had this experience themselves. They'll know what some good introductory points are. They'll know your abilities. You'll be able to talk to them about your interests. They'll be able to recommend accessible starting points. So give them an email as soon as you can. Ask them if you can have a few minutes of their time to talk about it. They'll almost always say yes. Your teachers care about you. You know, they want you to learn. They want you to succeed. And teachers love it when they get you know, asked about the subjects that they enjoy. Teachers are teachers because they love learning as much as they love teaching. If you've ever gotten a teacher talking about their degree subject in a lesson, you know it can go off the rails a little bit in a good way. So don't be afraid to talk to your teachers and they'll give you some ideas. Introductory guides. We mentioned introductory guides and short YouTube videos and TED Talks earlier. This is where they're useful. They don't count as supercurricular study in and of themselves because they don't have the depth. But what they are, are brilliant roadmaps. They'll be able to tell you the places to go, you know, for the big thinkers, even explain some of those ideas in advance so you know what you're reading and can understand it a little bit better. You can follow what's going on. If you're going to buy one book, I would buy a good introductory guide to your subject because that can be the launching pad for your supercurricular study, your further reading from there. And that can be absolutely brilliant. Having that roadmap is absolutely vital to knowing where you're going sometimes. Once you've started your reading, don't be afraid to follow the footnotes and the bibliographies because this is how academic reading kind of works. When I was in my teens, I thought the footnotes were basically oh, uh, just where all the good book jokes in a Terry Pratchett book were, and that was kind of their main use. But in academia, what they are are references to the other ideas, the thinkers that they are either taking stuff from or criticising. So if you follow those links in the footnotes and the bibliographies, read some of those other works by those people being mentioned, you're exploring it in more depth, just like an academic does, demonstrating those skills. So don't be afraid to try following those and see what happens. Now, once you've worked out what to read, getting hold of the books themselves is kind of the tricky bit and made a little bit trickier by the current situation. Because while much of this can be done online, not necessarily all of it. 
First up, if you do have access to libraries, depending on when and where you're watching this, libraries are fantastic. You can get your books for free, get yourself a library card, and in fact, you'd also have the right to use university libraries. If you're able to get access to them, they are one of the best places because you'll be able to almost guarantee if the book's on their reading list, it'll be in their library. And you can get an idea of what it's like, you know, actually being at a university dealing with the library system. Online repositories are now also available. You may find that schools, public libraries and some university libraries will be able to get hold of books for you in an online manner. You know, PDF files, Kindle, whatever. So you can access them from home. So it's worth giving them an email and asking. Secondhand books. I would almost never recommend buying a new book, especially when it comes down to textbooks. They tend to cost a lot more and also they tend to be a little less useful. I would buy secondhand where you can. So get on some online retailers, Amazon, etc. And I would go straight for the secondhand ones. First up, they're cheaper, just because of supply and demand. That's how it works. They will almost always be cheaper than buying a brand new one. And that saves you money. It shouldn't cost you a ton to do further reading. It should barely cost you anything at all. You should be able to do it, ideally, for pretty much free. Um, so better on cost. But as well as that, one of the best things about secondhand books is you'll find a lot of people, a lot of students who have had them before, especially if it's a popular textbook, they'll have written notes in the margins. Don't trust a word of them. You have no idea who this person is who's writing the notes, but they're great launching points for having a little bit of an extra think about what you're actually reading. If you see a note, do you agree with that? Do you disagree with that? It's a chance to think more deeply about the thing that you're reading. It gives you pause and opportunity for reflection and further thought. So a secondhand book, to my mind, is far, far more valuable than a brand new one. Talk to your schools. You may have access to online journals and magazines, which you can access from home. So a lot of them will have access to things like the British Medical Journal, for example, or repositories of online articles that you can get hold of. If you're not sure, talk to your head of sit form and they should be able to give you an indication of what's available and what you can access at home. And as well as that, you can buy a lot of good books online, sometimes for almost nothing. Kindle, other reading apps, things that you can get on your phone. You can get hold of a lot of books really quite easily and at low cost. In addition, especially if it's an older piece of work that's out of copyright, it might even be free. Do be careful of translations on some of these because um, some of them may be a little bit out of date. But otherwise, they can be a great way to access this reading from home. Even if everything is still fully locked down, you'll be able to access that content really, hopefully, fairly easily. So there's a lot of ways, even if things are still fairly locked down, that you can access all of this information, all of these books and things that you're going to need to be able to do this supercurricular study. Just a little bit of thought, a little bit of planning, and you'll be able to get there, hopefully, fairly easily. Um, a few final hints regarding supercurricular study. The first one that I've got on the presentation here really is the most vital. I think a lot of times we often think that, especially when we're learning, it's kind of built into the school systems that we should always be improving all the time. Everything should always be getting better and better and better and better. And that's not how academic study at university works. You're going to find dead ends. You're going to find things to read that aren't that relevant. You start and you realise, actually, this isn't really kind of saying what I need it to say or actually fitting in as well as I thought. And that's okay. Researchers, academics reach dead ends all the time. Don't think that absolutely everything has to be relevant. If it's not, but it's one side, try something different. But it's okay for that to happen. Don't feel bad about it. Don't feel worried about it. Don't feel stressed. It's just part of academic life at university and beyond. Um, Make sure you read the relevant parts at least of a book and be honest about what you've read. Don't claim that you've read the whole thing. If you haven't read the whole thing, say that you've read excerpts and that's A-OK. -okay. Um, and as I said before, if you're going to get one book only, get a good quality introductory guide. It really is going to be that roadmap that you need to help explore that subject in more detail. So my final point before I wrap things up, and I know this has been a little long, but hopefully useful to everyone. Keep a record of everything that you have read or done. And that is going to be really, really vital. I'm not in the interest of creating extra work for you, but this is going to help you when you come to write your personal statements. Keep a record. Anything that you've done before now, by the way, counts. So anything you've done before or you're about to do, keep a record of it. So what you've read or done. Think about what did I learn from it? What really inspired me? Which ideas did I find particularly interesting? 
Which ones do I think were total utter garbage and should get in the seat straight away and why? These notes are going to be what really builds your personal statement. They're going to be talking about how you've interacted with that work. Because at the end of the day, we're thinking about you know, how an essay is structured. It's not the evidence or the point that's the most important part of a paragraph. It's the explanation step. It's what you take from that evidence and what you can say from it. And it's the same here. So note down a few of the things that you found particularly brilliant or inspiring or interesting or terrifying or ridiculous and keep those notes on it. Some bullet points will be really, really valuable here. You'll be able to then also pick out which are the most relevant bits of supercurricular study that you've done. A lot of times people ask me, oh, how much should I do? And it really is hard to say. There isn't a set number for this. The answer is going to be enough. But you won't know you've done enough until you've kind of catalogued it and work it, worked out, okay, have I got enough to really fill that space? A lot to talk about here. Doing a bit more is better than doing too little. You can then cherry pick the best ones. So start yourself a new document on your phone, an Excel spreadsheet, grab a new notebook, keep a record of everything that you're reading as part of your supercurricular activity and keep it handy for when you do your first drafts of your personal statement. We'll use that information to help build that first draft really, really strongly. Um, so some ideas of what to note down here, you know, inspiration, which ideas particularly good, bad or interesting. How does it link to the other things that you've read? If you can start building those links between works, that's really valuable. It shows some great academic skills that we'd be looking for at university. How has this affected your perspective, your views, your ideas? We don't have to agree with everything. We can disagree with anything we like, but everything that we read is gonna shape our academic views. And we wanna see how this has shaped yours and started you down that path to being a brilliant university student. I'm gonna wrap things up here. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this has been useful. We'll have more videos coming up on this channel very shortly. But for now, my contact details are up on the screen. If you've got any questions about university admissions, particularly Cambridge, do get in touch. Don't hesitate to use that email address. I'll get back to you as soon as we're able. Go forth and geek out. Go and enjoy your subject. Explore that, especially if you've got a bit of extra unexpected free time right now. This is your opportunity to really dive in deep, enjoy learning. Go out there, do it yourself, just like you're gonna be doing a little bit at university and explore because at the end of the day, that's one of the most valuable things that you can do, especially if you've got a little bit of extra time right now. So don't be afraid to go out. Don't be afraid to find some things that are irrelevant. Don't be afraid to be an explorer. And that is really, really gonna help when you are applying for university and it's going to mean that you've got those skills ready to start to absolutely thrive when you get there. Thanks a lot. Um, hopefully see you sometime soon. Stay well, everyone.